With the growing emphasis on experiential learning and advanced pedagogy, many countries are on a trajectory to achieve academic excellence. However, on another side of the globe, there are still countries locked in a cycle of poverty, lacking basic needs. Sadly enough, the value of differences is too steep. One city in a developed country may have students exploring the world through virtual and augmented reality, roaming freely in their classroom. On the other hand, a city in a developing country may not even have adequate benches. The narrative seeks attention. But there is hope. Ordinary students can become extraordinary when they are fascinated by their lessons and take interest in learning. Such students find innovation everywhere. By introducing these students to practical learning, especially the different modes of cloud-based learning, the situation will improve and their interest and focus on education will gradually burgeon. Microsoft's education team beholds the ambitious goal to empower every learner on the planet to achieve more. To achieve this, Microsoft has been closely working with researchers and institutes all over the world. Let's welcome the general manager of Microsoft's education team, Dan Ayoub. Uh, it's, I'm really excited to be here. My name is Dan Ayub. I'm the General Manager of Education at Microsoft. Um, currently working remote, um, just, just probably like, like many of you. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, very excited to be here and uh, have recently joined the Education Community uh, Committee for the VRARA. And, uh, you know, very super excited to, to be working in this field. I think, um, you know, a bit about my background. My movement into education was certainly by no means a straight line. I'm actually from a game development background where I worked for a number of years and uh, had always been really interested in education, in particular how technology could improve learning outcomes for students. Uh, but I never really had a great sense of how to go about it and how to get involved from an educational standpoint. And um, you know what, what was kind of transformative for me was I was working on um, games for VR and I was doing a bunch of research just to see how we could design more effective games and how to make these games more engaging. And I found a bunch of, I stumbled onto a bunch of research around how the brain reacts to VR and AR. And I started to become fascinating about what that could mean for education. Um, you know, and long story short, you know, one of the great things about Microsoft is we have so many different groups and divisions and departments, you can move around and do a bunch of different things. And I was fortunate enough to be able to move into the HoloLens group where I started working in education um, experiences for that and just starting to see what was possible. And from there, I moved into our core education group where I sit now, where I oversee um, a number of things, but certainly this is still very near and dear to my heart. So, um, you know, talking a little bit about the digital transformation and education, um, you know, it's, it's fascinating at this point of time to have this conversation because, you know, we were already starting to see some interesting movements toward this kind of technology pre-COVID. I can certainly say on my side, um, I can really only describe it as uh, an explosion of interest in MR technologies since COVID has happened, particularly where it relates to experiential learning. So you look at uh, areas in particular like medical and engineering and things like that, where they very much have a need to obviously graduate uh, medical personnel. That's more important now than ever, but that's not optimal on say, uh, you know, a video conference or something like that. Students really need that experiential learning to really grasp it. And uh, what's fascinating, as folks may have seen, we had a really large example of that with Case Western University um, a couple of months ago, where uh, you know the team, Mark and the team over there, super, super forward thinking, have been using HoloLens to teach medical anatomy for um, a number of years now. And when COVID was looking like it was going to shut down their institution, they wanted to make sure their students didn't suffer for it. And um, what they ended up doing was sending a HoloLens home with every student and continuing their anatomy uh, training from a distance. And it was fascinating. I got to take uh, an anatomy class with them. I was easily the least competent person in that class. Uh, but it was fascinating. You had uh, almost 200 students across 11 countries all continuing their studies uh, using MR technology. And you know, since then, we've heard from another, a number of other institutions, particularly at least in North America, you know, as we're coming into the new school year, where um, a number of universities are saying like, hey, we need to continue to do this. We can't use video technologies. We really need more experiential learning. So I feel like you know, COVID has certainly accelerated that digital transformation and has increased interest in this kind of technology. Um, and you know, learning has changed 
incredibly just in the last eight months, forget about the, you know, the two years prior to it, you know, we were already starting to see a move towards this more experiential collaborative style of learning. And I think that's even, uh, that's more important now than ever. And this kind of technology I think is going to be at the forefront of it. It still has a number of challenges that I think we need to get over um, for it to be adopted heavily in learning and in the workplace. Um, you know, people ask me a lot what I think my, my top three are. Uh, I think it's certainly, uh, you know, cost definitely remains a barrier. I think access to uh, great content is challenging as well. I think there are limitations to the content that's out there as well as creation tools, because I think you have a lot of very smart people who have the curriculum in their heads, um, but it's still not simple for them to create their own their own types of content. And then I think it's just knowledge of what's possible. And that's kind of like a large category. Uh, we were talking just prior to this about, you know, uh, awareness and making people more aware of it. I think that's certainly a big, big part of it. But I think there's also a skepticism around what technology can do. And, um, you know, later on, I'll talk about some of the data, you know, a bit of the data we've pulled together. As I like to say, I was immediately challenged by educators when we started talking about this to provide data showing that this was actually going to change learning outcomes. And uh, I'll talk through some of it um, as we go forward. But, you know, the other thing I think is worth noting is, you know, we're talking about um, schools and education. Uh, there's also the modern workplace that has changed, right? And as we say, like our goal at Microsoft and the education team is to empower every learner on the planet to achieve more. Um, that's not, learning is not a set point in time. Uh, certainly not as it was when I was a child, where it was like this defined period where you would went to go to school. Everybody needs to be lifelong learners today. And I think, uh, you know, disruption is, is evidence of that more than ever. And the workplace is um, looking very aggressively at ways to help upskill their, their workforces more effectively and more quickly, and now at a distance. And I think that's another very important opportunity for um, XR technologies, because um, Again, you've got the distance, but again, it's that experiential learning. You can get people in there. You can have them do things collaboratively to reinforce the learning in a way that you just can't do with video. Um, so I'm going to skip ahead a bit because I think this audience is pretty educated on, uh, you know, what this type of technology is. But um, let's let's get right to some of the learning outcomes that we've seen. So as I mentioned a little bit earlier, you know, we were, we were immediately challenged with show us the data, you know, show us the evidence that, that this is going to um, help my students. So the first thing we did was uh, pull together a, a bunch of peer reviewed documentation that uh, studied this technology and showed what was, what was possible with it. And, you know, we were really careful, certainly at the beginning, not to do our own because we didn't want any kind of bias or like, you know, let's pull together studies that have uh, already been peer reviewed that show the pros and the cons. And, you know, we quickly came across three very important pieces. First of all, learning outcomes, right? Uh, academic achievement scores and retention absolutely go up with this kind of technology. We saw, you know, we've seen levels anywhere, you know, from 30%. I know some of my colleagues and other um, organizations have seen even higher than that in their own research. But certainly, uh, grades go up and retention goes up. And um, I think, you know, we'll t I've got a few examples of that. Uh, Case Western, which I mentioned, has absolutely seen great improvements. And uh, some medical institutions have actually seen a full letter grade improvement when they implement this kind of technology. And, you know, I think there's a lot of reasons for that. I think you've certainly got the experiential uh, aspect of it. But I think, again, it's the aspect that of how the brain digests this information. It's a lot more engaging. It's retained as a memory uh, versus just something you read. And when you think about it, you know, from um, a learning standpoint, sitting passively in an audience absorbing information while someone's talking to you is the least effective way to actually learn anything. Um, so I think this kind of technology is really, really effective for that. Case Western went a step further uh, which, with some of their research, which I thought was super fascinating, where they actually measured time to knowledge acquisition. So how much more quickly could students learn the same content using this uh, technology? Uh, and th you know, they saw numbers up to 60%. So you know, students were not only getting better grades, they were actually learning um, a lot more quickly. Um, so it's, it's really, really fascinating. And the other thing that we've noted that I think is certainly applicable for today is um, it fosters self-directed learning. So at a time, you know, certainly with my own children, watching them do remote learning, uh, they get disengaged, they get bored. Uh, and, you know, this kind of technology is certainly very powerful to help students um, 
be more self-directed and drive to better academic outcomes. And a lot of this, like what it comes down to when you look at the research, is using this kind of technology reduces the cognitive load on a student. So it actually enables them to learn more efficiently and more quickly. And it starts to enable some really fascinating educational scenarios, which we're really interested, uh, particularly right now, distance learning. Um, you know, Case Western is a great example of something I say that nobody would have let us do pre-COVID, uh, you know, to try to do something of that scale. But I think it's been really effective. And, um, you know, Mark and the, the crew over at Case Western are really good about sharing it. So, you know, we've got a few examples just in closing. Um, you know, please feel free to reach out to me if people are interested in more. West Coast University, like I mentioned, has seen a full letter grade improvement. We've seen some really interesting outcomes uh, with dissection. Um, frog dissection and things like that in VR. And, um, you know, it's been really f great for me to be here. I quickly ran through my time. I could talk about this stuff forever because uh, it's, re it's really near and dear to my heart. Uh, please feel free to reach out to me. Uh, you know, my Twitter handle's up here. I'm on social media if anyone has any questions or would like to follow up. But thank you for having me. Thank you for the opportunity. Um, really excited about this, really excited about this community and um, stoked for what we can do together in the future. For Dan Ayoub. Thank you so much, Dan. Um, wearable technology like Microsoft's Mixed Reality HoloLens headset has the potential to fostering social and emotional learning. How would you add to that? It's about um, you know XR technologies. They've been called an empathy machine, um, and you know I think what's what's fascinating about it is you can literally put yourself into someone else's shoes um, in a way that I think has has not been possible before. And, you know, that's one of the areas I think that has gotten less attention, right? I'm glad you bring it up. Yeah, usually when people talk about this kind of technology, it's medical, it's engineering, things like that, just because these are places, or manufacturing, or, you know, notions like that, or training, because uh, people have glommed to those the most aggressively and uh, with the most speed for a number of reasons. But, you know, I get really interested in what it can mean for empathy, especially in today's, you know, in today's day and age, being able to see the world through other people's eyes is, is more important than ever. And, you know, I would love to see more people use this kind of technology. But, you know, we talk about, you know, walk a mile in someone else's shoes. Uh, up until recently, that's really just been an expression. You can use this type of technology to quite literally be in someone else's shoes. And I've seen some fascinating uses of it. I would love to see more. One that uh, uh, where you could be a child, like you know, a parent in the perspective of a child, so you can just see how much bigger and louder and the world uh, the world is. And then certainly from a cultural perspective, I think it's extremely valuable. So, yeah, that's an area I'm very interested. I would love to see more applications in that regard. Thank you, Dan. Um, artificial intelligence in education also means an avenue for students to indulge in self-guided learning. It also means that teaching will no longer limit itself to the peripheries of the classroom. How would you add to that? Yeah, you know, it's funny. People ask me what I get most excited about from this type of technology, and I inevitably come to the merging of, you know, XR technologies with artificial intelligence. Uh, I really think that's when this is really going to pop. You know, when you look at the modern educational system, at least in North America, um, it was really set up for scale, right? Like way, way, way back when one-on-one -on -one tutors was, was how education happened, but that was limited to, at the time, to very wealthy people. And these modern educational systems of one-to-many kind of evolved um, to allow broader access to education. But that ideal is still one-on-one. Uh, -on -one. And I, you know, as I start to get very excited and future facing just imagine a world where everyone has this private tutor that um you know it's it's assisting not only the student but the teacher possibly in this one-to-many scenario that kind of moves along our edu educational career with us knows where we've struggled knows where we haven't and is able to like tailor those individual educational experiences you know i get excited about that just on its own when you start to marry that with virtual reality and um uh, augmented reality experience, I, I think it gets even more fascinating. And you know, I, that's a future I'm very excited to see uh, shape up. Thank you so much, Dan. It was a pleasure to have you with us. It was a pleasure. Thank you so much for having me.